Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Mapping Cerebellum to Forebrain Connectivity Using Optogenetics and Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, presented by Dr. Paul Matthews, an investigator at LA Biomed and assistant professor of neurology at UCLA. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that today's event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of the screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Help Desk button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use that Ask a Question box to let us know you're having a problem. The presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credit tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process for obtaining more credits. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Paul Matthews. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Thanks. So I'm uh, definitely excited to talk to you today. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, LabRoots uh, neuroscience event. Um, I'll be telling you a bit about a methodological approach that we've used to begin to map cerebellum to forebrain connections. Um, the talk today will sort of follow this general outline. I'm going to tell you a bit about and remind you of cerebellar anatomy and connectivity. Um, I want to give you a, a little bit of a background as to some of the current limits in our understanding of cerebellar connectivity and function, especially in terms of connections to the forebrain and how it might be involved in a higher um, order brain uh, function. I'll tell you a bit about our recently published work that shows how we can utilize an approach to map region-specific connectivity between the cerebellum and forebrain by combining optogenetics and functional re resonance magnetic uh, imaging. And then at the very end, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're interested in extending this approach to understand the links between disruptions and connectivity and potentially psychiatric illness. So to start with, here's sort of an obligate uh, image of the cerebellum. I wanted to show you this in particular so that you could have some reference between both the human brain and that of the rodent brain. Today's talk will focus on experiments that were conducted in the mouse brain. So the cerebellum is located uh, just dorsal of the brain stem. There are a number of anatomical subdivisions that can be uh, described, including the anterior and posterior lobes, as well as a central uh, vermal region. Um, if we look at the ventral view, we can see that there's also this sort of evolutionarily old flocular nodular lobe. The cerebellum can be further broken down into a number of other anatomical subdivisions. On the right here, you can see a uh, cartoon of a human cerebellum, and on the left, that of a rodent, in this case, particularly a rat. The cerebellum from um, rostral to caudal, which is top to bottom in this, can be divided across nine different folia, and this is within the vermal region. We can, from medial to laterally, uh, divide it up into the vermis, paravermis, and hemispheres. And then we can continue to, in, at least within the hemispheres, uh, create a, a defined anatomical subdivisions, including the lateral, the, the simplex, LS there, cruise one, cruise two, uh, the paramedial lobule, um, as well as the paraflocculus, et cetera. Now, the, within the cerebellum is basically composed within all of these anatomical regions, a number of folia or invaginations, as you can see here, that uh, evolutionarily increase as you go from the rat, which you see in the top left, uh, down to the human in the bottom right. Within each of these folia, similar to what you see in the, the neocortex or the cerebral cortex, that these, that the cortical structure of the cerebellum is composed 
of a repeating motif of specific neurons that are interconnected in ways in which we have a pretty good idea of. Uh, the major players in this, although there are a few others, um, are granule cells, uh, the molecular layer interneurons, as well as probably the most well-known neurons in the cerebellum, that of the Purkinje neurons. This entire structure here, with, which is composed inside the, what's called the cerebellar cortex, um, receives inputs via two different pathways, specifically that of the mossy fiber pathway, which receives projections from a number of regions, including the cerebral cortex, the vestibular nuclei, the reticular formation in spinal cord, and information regarding sensory and, and proprioceptive information is um, brought into the cerebellum via this pathway. The other major input into the cerebellum is via the climbing fiber pathway, which originates in the inferior olive. And it's thought to bring in signals that generate changes within this overall circuit that are necessary for learning. The Purkinje neurons send projections down and out to the deep cerebellar nuclei, which can be further divided into the vestigial, interposed, and dentate, which you can see here, and then color matched all the way to the left in this anatomical version of a coronal slice of the, of the cerebellum. And then ultimately the deep cerebellar nuclei are, except for some vestibular regions of the cerebellum, the only projection, only areas that project out of the cerebellum. So the cerebellum can sort of grossly at this point be subdivided um, based on its inputs and outputs. That is, there is there are regions to, on the lateral uh, edge of the cerebellum that send and receive projections um, primarily through the thalamus to regions of the forebrain, and this uh, composes the cerebrocerebellum. The medial uh, third of the cerebellum uh, sends and receives uh, sensory and motor information um, and sends projections um, through descending tracts to the spinal cord, and is often called the spinocerebellum. And then you have the vestibular cerebellum, which communicates uh, with different regions of the vestibular uh, areas, including the vestibular nuclei. The cerebellum uh, does appear to have a topographical uh, representation of the body, at least multiple of these, is similar to what we see in both the sensory and motor uh, cerebral cortices in the cerebrum. However, we don't have a real clear understanding and have not been able to further delineate functional regions of the cerebellum to the point in which we can identify specific visual, potentially cognitive, um, or speech regions of the cerebellum. And of course, the major question is, is there really further evidence for these functional subdivisions and how might we begin to determine whether there are these functional subdivisions? Well, one way to do that, and the way we've often done that within uh, the cerebral cortex, is, is to begin to define both the inputs as well as the outputs. Now, the cerebellum has some projections that go towards the cerebrum, uh, and the classical view of this is that it's an open loop. That is, that the cerebrocerebellar loop consists of projections, mainly from uh, cortical structures like the motor, parietal, cingulate, and prefortum prefrontal cortices that project motor, sensory, and cognitive information to the pons. And that the pons then projects to the cerebellum via a pontocerebellar pathway, and then back through the ventral lateral thalamus to, in particular, the motor cortex, in which this information really provides a substrate for integrating the information that's needed by the primary motor cortex for the generation and control of movement. And really, a lot of what we know about the cerebellum and given uh, what we know about uh, diseases of the cerebellum, we, that it disrupts uh, motor behavior. However, uh, a, lot, a number of research studies over the last 20 to 30 years have really broadened our understanding of what the cerebellum might, what its function might be. Uh, this is certainly the case uh, with research that has been uh, pioneered by Jeremy Schmaman, who is uh, one of the keynote speakers in this series. So what is there? what evidence is there that the cerebellum might contribute in some fashion to uh, a more a more broad and diverse set of behaviors other than just motor function, which uh, is suggested by this type of cerebrocerebellar loop? Well, 
The pioneering work by Strick and colleagues has shown that there are a number of projections via uh, in predominantly regions in the dentate part of the cerebellar nuclei to a number of regions that are not only motor but also non-motor in function, including regions of the brain like the inferior parietal cortex and the prefrontal cortex. Further studies have also shown that there are projections to the striatum as well as the hypothalamus and the BTA. Unfortunately, for the most part, the majority of these studies have not shown any particular uh, projections all the way back up to uh, the cerebellar cortex. And so it's still unknown in terms of what, in terms of what the functional distribution of um, areas are within the cerebral cortex and even within the dentate itself. And part of this has to do with limitations in the methods that have been used to do these types of tracings, and that is basically using retrograde transsynaptic uh, methods. And the problem here is, is that oftentimes what one has to do is, is use a priori decisions in terms of the regions in which they'll inject these retrograde dyes, basically making a decision as to where to try to trace back into the cerebellum that the cerebellum projects to. What one would ultimately like to be able to do is, is to identify, is to do it in the reverse direction. That is, identify a specific region in the cere cerebellum and look forward as to where it is that it connects to. Unfortunately, even with new methods that we have for track tracing, um, which we can jump maybe one synapse, we're unable to to fully define and map out the different projections of discrete anatomical subregions of the cerebellum, in particular within the cerebellar cortex. So are these projections functional? Electrophysiological approaches have further um, validated that these projections do have functional relevance in that a number of studies have shown that by modulating activity predominantly within the cerebellar nuclei that you can record uh, changes in activity by modulating uh, regions of the cerebellum. However, still, we don't have a clear understanding of what these direct or indirect pathways are and in large part, we don't know which parts specifically of the cerebellum project to what array of regions down across the forebrain. Now, imaging networks suggest that there is a diversity in these projections and that the cerebellum interacts significantly with different parts of the forebrain. So imaging um, using resting state uh, magnetic resonance imaging has defined what are termed controlled networks. These are networks of interconnected brain regions that show correlation in activity during some type of brain state, such as the salience network, the executive control network, and the default mode network. Now, the cerebellum has been found to participate across a number of these uh, different control networks, including exec the executive control network. You can see to the right and left as there is an asymmetry in these uh, control networks, uh, and that it participates within the default mode, the salience, and the sensory motor network. And what's also interesting here is, is that it's not the entire cerebellum, but discrete regions of the cerebellum that appear to be involved in different types of control networks. What you see on the right here are structural scans of a hor of horizontal images of the cerebellum. And each of these colored areas indicates uh, that part of the brain is involved in a particular control network, which is indicated on the left. And you can see that there are discrete regions of the cortex that are involved in specific um, control networks, suggesting that different areas of the cerebellum are involved in specific functional aspects of behavior. And this has been uh, further illustrated by work by Yale and, and Buckner that looked, again, using um, resting state correlations to show that different areas of the cerebellar cortex have correlational activity with a wide variety of regions across the entire cerebrum. Work by Jeremy Schmaman, as I mentioned before, is the key, one of the keynote speakers uh, for this symposia has spent quite a lot of time and effort in trying to, in basically championing a uh, somewhat 
becoming more appreciated fact that the cerebellum is likely contributing to more than just the motor control domain. And a major challenge in this has been that non-motor behavior deficits that he, he has been able to define um, within cere cerebellar disorders are oftentimes much less obvious and intrusive than motor deficits and have it in most cases and are often um, ignored. But with some stringent tests, one can and have found that there are major domains within um, non-motor non domains in which the cerebellum appears to be uh, in control of and this are contributing to. And that includes behaviors and domains, including the intentional control, emotional control, autism spectrum, psychosis spectrum, and social skill set. And it's likely that all of that, the way that the cerebellum is contributing across this uh, diverse domain, this diverse set of domains is through interactions with the forebrain, and which suggests that we really do need to understand and define what are the functional regions of the cerebellum that project to the forebrain and what is the differences that exist across these different functional domains. So ultimately, what I'm really interested in is what types of methods can we use to specifically delineate from any given region within the cerebellar cortex, such as medial cruise one, what is the array of areas within the forebrain that it functionally connects to, that it interacts with, that it has influence on? So one of the challenges with this is, um, is basically due to the fact that Purkinje neurons are inhibitory. So one can't go into the cerebellar cortex, stick an electrode, stimulate, and then record downstream as the ultimate effect of, those, of that stimulation um, causes inhibition of the deep cerebellar nuclei. Of course, this inhibition is known to cause a, a biphasic uh, response, which I'll actually show you in a minute, and it's hard to utilize that in some senses as a way to properly drive output from the cerebellar cortex in order to understand what are the outputs regions um, that are modulated. So in order to control specific regions of the cerebellum, we've decided to take an optogenetic approach that takes microbial opsins that can transduce a change in the neural activity within the neurons, in particular, either channel root opsin 2 or ARCH. And we can use some genetic tricks to basically put them specifically into the Purkinje neurons in order to modulate their activity. And in this case, I'm basically using a strategy where we use an L7 or PCP to CRE, uh, driving um, the expression of either channel root opsin 2 fused with the YFP here on the right, or L7 CRE driving the expression of ARCH, an inhibitory opsin um, on the right. And of course, if we shine light onto these molecules, what we're able to do is, is cause a change in, in the neuron's activity that we could ultimately use to examine their uh, effects on downstream areas. And what you see on the right here is just some individual single cell recordings in an in vitro uh, slice preparation in which we show that by shining light onto Purkinje neurons, we can either on the left for neurons expressing channel rhodopsin 2 increase their activity, or on the right, if we shine light onto neurons expressing right, that we get a pause in activity. What happens in the live animal when we do this? So what we can do is, is we can use a, a, uh, recording electrodes and put them into the brain in a awake behaving animal, shine light, light onto Purkinje neurons expressing either arch or um, channel rhodopsin and see how it changes activity there. And of course, we see predictable changes. That is with the channel rhodopsin 2, which is an excitatory opsin, we get an increase in spiking and in ARCH, we get a pause in activity. Each of these lines on the top is an action potential, and so this is an example trace, and below is a peristimulus time histogram showing the overall activity of 50-plus uh, neurons. What we really were ultimately interested in was to determine how modulating the Purkinje neurons up the cerebellar cortex would influence those neurons down in the cerebellum. 
in the cerebellar nuclei. Because ultimately what we wanted was a method for driving a consistent and reliable um, output of the cerebellum from the cerebellar cortex that we could then investigate the rest of the forebrain with. And so what we did was we can report cord again here from now the cerebellar nuclei, shine light on the Purkinje neurons, and in animals that express channel rhodopsin 2, we get a, an expected pause in their activity during the light pulse and a big rebound um, excitation uh, subsequently. For the arch excressing mice, we can see that there's a, a relatively time-locked burst in activity that increases quite significantly. And that this increase in activity is correlated right with the timing of our laser light pulse. And we've seen this even for brief pulses, um, 10 of 10 and 25 milliseconds long. And so what we wanted, what we did was is we took this uh, particular approach in terms of using arch to drive activity from specific regions of the cerebellar cortex to drive output through the cerebellar nuclei. And then the question was, how do we detect and determine which regions of the forebrain are modulated by this activity? We could use electrodes, but then again, we'd have to make a priori decisions on exactly where to stick those electrodes. Of course, we have these large electrode arrays, but still we're only able to record for maybe a couple of brain regions at a time. And what we really wanted was a way to, in a brain-wide assay, to examine which of the regions downstream are modulated by this particular region, the cerebellar cortex. And so what we've done is, is we have utilized this optogenetic approach and the image above is just a coronal slice of the cerebellum and Purkinje neurons in green expressing the arch protein. And then below we've just shown that we can implant a fiber optic cannula into the brain. And what we've done is we've paired this to drive output from the cerebellum with functional magnetic resonance imaging, which allows us to observe uh, using changes in blood oxygenation level as a proxy for changes in neuronal activity, we can monitor what the changes are across the entire forebrain are in response to stimulation using optogenetics of a discrete region of the cerebellar cortex. So this is what we've done. Uh, what you see here, um, and as a function of the imaging and the of the imaging itself, uh, we needed to put the optic fiber in horizontally. Oftentimes, most people will put it in uh, vertically, uh, but there is a uh, a coil that has to sit on top of the of the mouse's head while we do this uh, imaging. And you can see that we can observe where the fiber was located in its implantation site uh, here in this histological preparation, as well as within this uh, structural scan from uh, an MRI image that was taken. What we did then was is to use a pulse of light that is of some frequency. And um, so we pause the Purkinje neurons driving output from the cerebellum at some frequency. So X hertz at 50 hertz duty cycle, and we did it on, off, on, off. And then we recorded the bold signals during the on and the off and compared them such that we could then determine which regions would, across the forebrain in particular were modulated by this uh, specific region of the cerebellar cortex. And in particular, we implanted it into a forelimb region of the cerebellum that we had previously shown that if we shined light onto it, we could drive a specific motor behavioral output. So results from this type of experiment here are shown on the right. What you can see on the top are basically um, structural scans uh, with an anatomical atlas outlined on top and then colored on top of that are regions uh, in which the bold signal or we can talk about it as being um, the neural activity within it are significantly modulated by light pulses in the cerebellar cortex. And in this case, I did it at five hertz, 10 hertz, and 20 hertz, because we weren't exactly sure as to what um, frequency would best drive outputs through the cerebellum. What we found is, is that actually low frequency versus high frequency drives uh, a significant output from the cerebellar cortex that can be detected both at the level of the 
thalamus, which is, you can see on the bottom left um, image of the brain. And then at 5 hertz, but not 10 and 20 hertz, we can see activation in the motor cortex, which you can see illustrated by that arrow. At the bottom here, we're basically looking at the percent bold change of the activated voxels within the motor cortex itself. And you can see that we see a relatively, um, we, we can detect changes in bold signal at 5 hertz, but we don't really see any significant activation across the 10 and 20 hertz um, that is at least prolonged across the entire stimulation, um, the light stimulation. So what just to clarify in terms of what's in these graphs here at the bottom, um, the green bar indicates the time periods over which the light stimulus is on. In red are the animals that express arch that were stimulated, and in black are animals that were stimulated by the light but did not express the light uh, manipulatable uh, opsin. We then wanted to know what the actual effects were at a single cell and with spike time resolution within these, this motor cortex brain region. And so we then utilized customizable silicon microprobes uh, that uh, were pioneered in Satiris Masmanidis lab at UCLA. And we basically took these probes that have multiple electrodes up to 128 or 128 probes that we used, and we implanted them into the motor cortex while we again uh, modulated the specific cerebellar drove output of the cerebellar cortex using the optogenetic approach. And what you can see are results to this on the right at the 5, 10, and 20 hertz in the motor cortex specifically. And so we implanted into the motor cortex the top graphs. Uh, each row is a single cell, and the changing colors uh, indicate the the fold change in the firing rate uh, into blue is a decrease in firing rate over baseline and red is an increase in firing rate over baseline. What you can see in the summary plots below is, is for all the, ac the excited cells in red that there is a prolonged increase in the spiking rate over the entire period shown in the green, by the green bar in its action potential rate, which we don't see in the 10 and 20 hertz. And it's likely that this is the reason, even though there may be a burst of activity or a response in the very beginning, um, that is unable to contribute well enough to a change in the bold uh, signal. So we believe that lower frequencies are better, at least um, in terms of this tool, for driving significant activity down into the motor cortex. We also um, were using a relatively, oh, and we also had, and this actually further summarizes what we saw within the electrophysiological study in that for the five hertz stimulation, we saw almost 80 to 90% of cells modulated in some fashion, either excited, inhibited, or showed a mixed response. While at 10 and 20, we showed, we found less than uh, 50%. And this is further summarized on the right in that, or what we also observed was is that the sustained response was very different between the five Hertz compared to the 10 and 20 Hertz, in which if you look on the left here, in the average excited uh, cha full change in activity, that there's this hump of red uh, demonstrating or illustrating a increase in change in activity that continues throughout the entire light pulse. Whereas in the 10 and 20 Hertz, this is not really apparent. We wanted to take a look at whether the pulse length or the frequency itself was the biggest driver in this difference. And so we tested a few different frequencies with different duty cycles, that is different uh, durations of the light pulse itself. And so we basically tried five Hertz, 25 millisecond long pulses. And so this five Hertz, 25 milliseconds was um, provided to the the cerebellar cortex for an entire 30 seconds, so this should be clear. And then we tried 20 hertz to 25 milliseconds and then compared it to what we had already seen in terms of the five hertz and 100 milliseconds. And we found that really the 
that the duration of the pulse also had a significant effect on the amount of uh, activation or modulation that we saw in the motor cortex. We also wanted to test whether we could drop the light intensity. We did find that we did need to use 143 milliwatts, which is about a 20 milliwatt um, power out of the tip of the fiber. Um, and if we did a back calculation, this does indicate that we are, this does suggest we are still only activating on average around a few hundred Purkinje neurons. This further illustrates that the higher intensity stimulation is necessary to significantly drive output downstream. Again, I want to illustrate that this is not what we're, we're not trying to show what a physiological range is. What we're trying to do is, is determine a, a parameter space that will provide us um, the sets of frequencies or the frequency that we would best observe changes in downstream activity in order to use this as a mapping tool, which is what we've done here. So we use the 5 hertz, 143 milliwatt uh, stimulation. Again, this was across a 30 second on, 30 second off. And we control and we compared this in, in arch expressing versus control. And what you see here is a set of uh, structural scans from rostral at the top to caudal on the bottom here, going from left to right and down. And each of the and within each of these panels, you can see significantly activated voxels in specific regions across the brain. And so what we found was is that for this one discrete region of the cerebellum, cerebellar cortex, that we could drive functional activation in multiple regions across the brain. And here's just a summary table of some of the regions that we found activated, including places like the thalamus, the hippocampus, reticular formation, motor cortex, anterior cingulate cortex. We saw little to no activation um, in places like the basal ganglia, interrhinal cortex, and insular cortex. And it should be noted that the basal ganglia has been at least um, implicated in connectivity with the cerebellum. However, it may just be that there's one particular functional region does not project strongly to that area. And it's really that key question as to what are the parts of the cerebellar cortex that project to any of these given regions that is a major uh, question that we have. And we think that this um, approach might be able to answer. To examine some of these different brain regions um, in particular, so we saw modulation of downstream sites in the thalamus, the retrosplenial cortex, the hippocampus, as well as the motor cortex. Here we can we show the change in bold signal specifically with inactivated voxels only within um, those regions of the brain that are illustrated across the top here. So you have basically a structural scan illustrating the brain region, and then on top of that, the mask that we use um, to pinpoint which we're within our um, scanning image uh, that we're looking at changes in. Uh, where we're looking for significantly activated voxels. We can then drop recording electrodes into these same regions and look to see whether there are differences in the way that the cerebellum modulates activity in each of these regions. So the next level question really is, is for this particular region of the cerebellar cortex, how exactly does it modulate downstream activity at the single cell level? And we can even detect not only excitable excitation, but also inhibition which to some degree is a bit of a challenge using um, fMRI approaches. And what you can see down across the bottom here is, and we're plotting now, um, the change in rate normalized to the baseline so that we can compare across these four different regions, the change in activity uh, during the, the 30 second light pulse, laser pulse of five Hertz, 134 milli, milliwatts per millimeter squared. And you can see that there is a diversity in the types of influence the cerebellar cortex has on these regions. Within the thalamus, it appears that for the most part, it is a relatively sustained response, whereas regions like the motor cortex actually appear to have a more distributed set of activity in which only at different time points across the stimulation um, are they active. 
We further validated uh, this approach um, utilizing CFOS staining, which is a marker for changes in or really act activation of neurons. And basically what we looked at were specifically in the motor cortex, as well as in this case, the anterior cingulate cortex. And we found that there were significant increases in the mice that expressed ARCH that were stimulated versus those mice that did not express ARCH that were stimulated. And that's shown here on the right. Each of these dots here basically is an individual neuron that is expressing the CFOS protein. And you can see that there are much more of them um, in the top, which is the arch expressing versus the bottom, which is the non-arch expressing that are controls. And then this is further uh, summarized in the plot below. So hopefully what you will take home or stay where you are, given the, the digital nature of this uh, talk, is that brief synchronous Purkinje neuron pauses can drive cerebellar output via the cerebellar nuclei and can be used to then investigate downstream brain regions. And that discreetly modulating the, in this case, a uh, forelimb region of the cerebellum results in modulation across not just a few, but quite a diverse array of flora and midbrain regions, some of which may be due to indirect um, activity uh, due to the uh, proprioceptive input from the forelimb uh, movements. And that the combination of optogenetics, fMRI, and the multi-electrode array recordings can really be used as a, a platform to provide brain-wide mapping of cerebellar projections. And our goal is, is to really begin to understand and to utilize this approach a little bit further to examine what happens to this connectivity and this communication between the cerebellum in disease, in which there are changes within these connectivities and to define what those changes are and potentially to be able to relate them to um, specific uh, disease states. And of course, one can utilize not only optogenetics, but one can also utilize um, chemogenetics to specifically modify the activity within these specific regions. And we can use not only um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, but resting state magnetic, magnetic, resting state functional magnetic resonance imaging um, to begin to assess how there are, how perturbations in this, in the cerebellar cortex, either as a function of chemogenetics, optogenetics, or even genetic manipulations and mouse models of disease to give us a better sense as to which regions within the, the forebrain are being disrupted, and then potentially utilize that information as targets for therapeutics. And I do want to end with a, a, a list of diseases that have at least implicated the cerebellum in potentially being either affected or being responsible for. So it's a little bit of a chicken or the eggs a question here and whether the overall uh, pathogenesis of the disease causes changes in the cerebellum or whether disease processes in the cerebellum actually generate some of the symptomology of the disease. And it's approaches like the ones that I've described that would allow us to do and look um, longitudinally across mouse models of disease to begin to assess where and which of the connect connections and areas of the brain are being perturbed first and giving us a better sense as to whether um, it is the cerebellum that is driving a major, it is contributing a major effect to the overall symptomology within diseases such as autism spe spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, schizophrenia et cetera. So I'd like to really thank my new lab. Um, I've been in this job for about two years and the work that I just showed you was um, published in the journal NeuroImage and was accepted just uh, last week. Um, I'd really like to thank my technician, Carlos Sanchez, who um, helped to pioneer my lab doing the electrophysiological multi-electrode array recordings. Um, and I certainly want to thank my partner in crime, Katrina Cho, who uh, we worked on uh, the paper together, and then for all of the help that Neil Harris as well as Tom Otis contributed um, to the work.
And also I'd like to thank Satiris Masmanides for providing um, both resources as well as technical uh, help uh, with the multi-electrode arrays. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Matthews, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type that question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look at our incoming questions from our audience members now. <clears throat> Dr. Matthews, what advantages does the OFMRI approach provide compared to track tracing methods that have been previously used to show cerebellum to forebrain connectivity? Yes, so thank you. Yeah, so the OFMRI, which is optogenetic functional magnetic resonance imaging, so we keep putting more of these letters together or resting state, et cetera. Um, so the major advantage here is, is that we're going from a cerebellum to forebrain rather than from a priori decisions downstream and trying to track them all the way back up into the cerebellum. So most of the classical track tracing methods have used um, transsynaptic methods that basically trace retrogradely, that is from um, the source back to, from the target back to the source. So injections within the prefrontal cortex are then mapped all the way back, to, are injected and then mapped all the way back to the cerebellum. This approach allows us to move from the forward direction in, in which we can manipulate discrete regions of the cerebellum. We can use small uh, optic fibers, uh, 100, 200 micrometers in diameter, and affect only small areas of the cerebellum. And we've calculated on the order of a few hundred um, uh, Purkinje neurons. And then we can do a brain-wide assay, which is also something that's limited within the current um, track tracing methods, to see what regions are modulated. And this is not dependent upon, and this is not dependent upon single uh, on issues related to uh, the number of synapses. Um, there are, of course, some new approaches that allow for anterograde uh, track tracing, and those are going to be quite powerful. However, they are still limited to jumping basically a single synapse. And until they're capable of jumping s multiple synapses, like some of the retrograde tracers are, um, we're going to have to find other approaches to map out, especially within the cerebellar cortex, which is sending projections from Purkinje neurons to the cerebellar nuclei to, uh, in most cases, the thalamus, and then out to other brain regions. Thank you for that, Dr. Matthews. Here's our second question. Where were there any surprising regions of the forebrain activated by stimulation of the cerebellar cortex? So yeah, we there were a few that we um, didn't completely anticipate. Maybe the hippocampus and probably the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, the hippocampus, at least the dorsal hippocampus, seemed um, significantly activated. Uh, there has been some indication uh, from uh, the lab of Ishvan uh, Soltis that um, that that there that one can modulate activity. Uh, in the hippocampus uh, with stimulation in the cerebellar cortex, um, but the direct pathways uh, between the cerebellum and the hippocampus aren't known. I think that there are certainly some people out there looking at that. Um, I think that it's pretty interesting that a, a putative sort of non-motor area like the anterior cingulate cortex is modulated uh, here. And it certainly would be interesting to begin to probe using these uh, multi-electrode arrays and some behavioral paradigms to begin to understand what that communication might be for. Thank you for that. And I want to remind audience members today that any questions not asked can be asked and we will answer them via email from the presenter. Dr. Matthews, thank you so much for today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for the audience? No, I, I don't think so.
<laughs> okay, I'd like to once again thank Dr. Matthews for his presentation, and I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. We, before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available on demand through June 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.